Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, good to see everybody in, and uh, even though it's the last program this afternoon, we still kept most of you here. And uh, we always want to thank our studio audience for coming in, because as I've said over and over, I, I couldn't do this without a class in front of me, because I just told Gary a little bit ago, he asked how I was working sitting on the stool, you know, and I said, but you know what? I said, I get so engrossed in just teaching my studio class, I forget that the cameras are even over there. And uh, I think maybe that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, I might get a little bit worried about what's going out over the airwaves. But I, a lot of times, don't even know what's going out until it comes back. And they'll say, well, you said. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't always remember that I said it. But anyway, for those of you watching out on television, we do. We, we appreciate so much hearing from you. And uh, so many of you have written that you feel like you're sitting on the back row. And that's just exactly the way we want to come across, that you're just part of a Bible class. We don't claim to be a theologians or anything like that. Uh, I've compared it more than once to just a Sunday school class. We're just simply studying the Word and uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay, let's go back where we left off. And uh, for those of you that were watching your last program, for some of you, it's a week ago. For some of you, it was the day before. But uh, I wanted to mention three crucial areas of the Middle East that were intrinsic to the book of Genesis. And so before we go back and pick up in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at those three a moment. <clears throat> the first one, of course, is in Genesis. I think it's chapter 22, 23, where is it? 23. In Genesis chapter 23, we have the death of Sarah, Abram's beloved wife, the one who was part and parcel of that Abrahamic covenant and the birth of Isaac. But now she dies. And uh, I think starting right here, we find that part and parcel of the whole Jewish mental makeup is a reverence for their burial sites. And even today, even today, if bulldozers are working in Israel and they turn up human bones, they have to stop. Now, in America, all it takes is a snail darter or something like that. But uh, in, in Israel, if they turn up human bones, then everything stops because they have such a respect for the human dead. And I think it began right back here with Abraham making such a big deal over a burial place for his beloved wife, Sarah. All right. Genesis chapter 23, and uh, oh, let's see. Start at verse 3. Now, we're not going to read all these. We're just going to hit a couple of the highlights. But in Genesis 23, Abraham has been mourning over his wife, Sarah. Verse 3, and so Abraham stood up from before his dead, spake unto the sons of Heth. Now, remember, it's still the land of Canaan. And Abraham says, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee a sepulchre, but that thou mightst bury thy dead. And so Abraham stood up, and I'm always making the mention of the fact that he must have had his eye on this place for quite a while. That if and when somebody was going to die, that's where he wanted them buried, or even himself. All right, and so he says, verse 8, He communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead on my side, entreat me for Ephron, the son of Zohar, 
that he may give me not a cave, but what? The cave. He had one in particular. That he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place. Well, now in the intervening verses, they haggle over the price and so on and so forth. But now come on over with me to verse 16. 23, verse 16. <clears throat> and Abraham hearkened under Ephron. And Abraham, now watch this, underline it, pass it on to anybody that will listen. And Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees in the field that were all the borders round about, were made sure unto Abraham for a possession. In other words, they deeded it to him. And it was agreed in the presence of those Canaanites that it was a done deal. And Abraham buried his wife, Sarah. All right, now Mamre, the cave of Machpelah, is today's Hebron. In the news, constantly. Because it is a controversial place now between the Palestinians and the Jews. Now, when I say Palestinians, that just brings another thought. How many people are confused by the term Palestine? Now, it's a scriptural word. You'll find it way back in Exodus. But I'm going to make a point. Didn't intend to do this, but I'm going to make a point. You want to remember that the word Palestine is merely a term of geographical area much like we refer to the Midwest here in the United States. Now, there's not a person in this room that doesn't know what we're talking about when we talk about the Midwest. But does the Midwest have a definitive border? No. Does the Midwest have a capital? No. Does the Midwest have a flag? No. Does the Midwest have a government? No. It's merely a geographical area that I imagine almost anyone in the world, if you would talk about the Midwest, they'd know exactly what you're talking about. Another area is the Sahara. Same thing. Does the Sahara have definitive borders? Nope. Is Sahara a nation? No. Does the Sahara have a flag or a constitution? No. Does it have an intrinsic language? No. But again, there isn't a person in this room that if I speak of the Sahara, you know what I'm talking about, that huge area of the northern part of Africa. I can give you another one, the South Pacific. The South Pacific is a huge geographical area. Everybody knows what you're talking about. Does it have a government? No. Does it have a flag? No. See? All right, that's Palestine. Palestine is just a generalized geographical area there in the Middle East from the Mediterranean out east. It has never, never been a definitive area. It has never had a government. It has never had a definitive language. It's just simply like the Midwest, the Sahara, the South Pacific, Palestine. It's an area in which various people have lived. Now, when you go back into biblical history then, who were the true Palestinians? Well, early on it was the Canaanites. They were living in the area of Palestine. Then it became the deeded land of Israel, so the Jew was the true Palestinian. 
And then the Arabs started coming in for whatever reason. All right, now what it really should boil down to is that we should define the people as a Palestinian Jew and a Palestinian Arab. But everybody's got it all wrong. They have gotten to the place now because of the propaganda machines that the Palestinians are the occupiers of the land of Palestine. They're not. They don't occupy all of Palestine. In fact, a good portion of Palestine is the present day Jordan. A good part of Palestine, as the term implies, is maybe even parts of Syria. Well, so it's just become a complete mix mash of definitions that Palestine is not a nation. It is not a definitive government. It's merely people living in a generalized geographical area. Now, maybe that'll help. All right, so the Jews now then are inhabitants of Palestine ever since they became a nation, especially under Moses. And it's been their homeland. All right, but go back further than Moses, go to Abraham. He already bought a tract of land and paid silver for it in what is today the city of Hebron. All right, let's look at the second one. Jump up 10 chapters and go to Genesis chapter 33. Jacob has just come back from his 20 years with his uncle Laban. And you all know that account. And as he's coming back, he has just met with his brother Esau in the early part of this chapter. But now drop in, honey, at chapter 33, verse 18. <clears throat> now this is what I call Bible study. This just simply compares Scripture with Scripture. What does the book say? All right, in chapter 33, Jacob is now coming back from Laban. Verse 18, and he came to Shalem, a city of Shechem. That's the name of the tribe, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city, that is of Shechem. And he bought, now watch this all carefully, he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Now what do you call that? A transaction. He bought it and paid for it. No doubt got title deed. And upon that bought piece of property, he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. In other words, a recognition of Jehovah. All right, now let's jump over to the last verses of Joshua. Joshua, that would be chapter 24. Joshua 24. Wait till you all find it. Joshua 24. Now you see why I left Hebrews when it spoke of Joseph's bones. Here it is. Joshua 24, verse 29. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. Now remember the history here. When Israel came into the land of Canaan, Moses had died and Joshua picked up the leadership. And Joshua, I think, ruled the nation of Israel something like 26 years, if I'm not mistaken. Not a long, long time. But anyhow, at the end of Joshua's life then, he dies being 110 years old and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaosh. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. 
and who had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Now here it comes. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, they buried in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. Now you see why I stopped in Genesis 33. Same piece of ground. It's still recognized as belonging to the children of Israel. And in that piece of ground they buried the bones of Joseph. See? And it became the inheritance then of the children of Joseph. And there's nothing, nothing to abrogate that. It's still valid. It's still their deeded property. They bought it. They paid money for it. All right? So that's the present day city in Israel of Nablus. Watch for Nablus in the news. Every once in a while, there's another bombing, there's another shooting, there's a whatever, because it's a point of controversy. Now, who is the progenitor of every point of controversy? The devil. That's Satan's work. All right, so we got two of them covered. Hebron, Abraham bought it. Nablus, Jacob bought it. Now Jerusalem. Now jump all the way up to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. All got it? 2 Samuel, chapter 24. Let's start at verse 18. 2 Samuel, chapter 24. We're beginning at verse 18. Now David is king. And of course, early in David's reign, Hebron was his capital. And uh, then he moved the capital from Hebron up to Jerusalem. And this is the beginning of that. All right, verse 18. And so Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And remember the Jebusites lived in the area of what is now Jerusalem. <coughs> and David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded, and Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. Now, of course, at this time, there was a plague on Israel for a rebellious act. Verse 22, And Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, threshing instruments, other instruments of the oxes for wood. All these things did Arana as a king give unto the king David. And Arana said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Arana, Nay, I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor. Underline that. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. 
And David built there an altar on the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, so the Lord was entreated for the land. All right, what spot is this threshing floor? Well, it's the Temple Mount. It's where the temple was built years later under Solomon. So here again, you've got a piece of property that was bought and paid for by David in this case, which today is one of the disputed places in our everyday news. Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And all these things just simply scream at us that if people would just simply know and believe the Word of God, we wouldn't have any problems. But the world won't do it. The Arabs won't. The UN won't. Western Europe won't. And so it'll just continue to deteriorate, of course, until the King of Kings comes. And, uh, you know, I've instructed over the years, when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what are you praying for? For the Lord to come. Jerusalem will know no peace until Christ returns. It's going to be a point of controversy right up until the second coming itself. Well, okay, now we've only got about half our program left, don't we? Back to Hebrews chapter 11. Now we'll pick up another one. Now I can almost wish I had more than 15 minutes. Moses. Moses. What, what a place of instruction again. Now I've got to always remind you, why do we study these Old Testament things? They're for our learning. I can't take you back here in Genesis and show you the plan of salvation. No more than I can do it in Hebrews. But oh, you can sure learn a lot. How that all of the workings of God have been coming down human history bringing us to the time of Christ and his finished work of the cross, the appearance of the Apostle Paul and the revelations that gave us the gospel of the grace of... You know, it reminds me. I've always said I won't attack people. I don't attack names or groups or anything like that. But once in a while I read things that just curls my hair. And one of them was early this morning. I was reading from a gentleman that is no longer alive a well-known, highly respected Bible scholar. And he was pointing out that Jesus and the Twelve preached the same gospel that Paul did. And all oh, my toes just double up in my boots. How can they say something like that when Paul's gospel says Christ died for you and rose from the dead? Could they preach that before it ever happened? See, that's my question. How could they preach death, burial, and resurrection back here in his earthly ministry? Well, then some people like to tell me, and I've referred to this, the guy said, well, they must have known. No, they didn't know. Luke 18, just as plain as day, the Lord says, we go up to Jerusalem. Everything written by the prophets will be accomplished. He will be scourged, he will be beaten, he'll be put to death, and on the third day he will rise again from the dead. So far, so good, but what does the next verse say? You know. And they knew none of these things. The twelve didn't. Well, if they didn't know what he was talking about, how could they preach it? See what I'm saying? How could they preach death, burial, and resurrection when they had no idea that it was going to happen? And then they tell me that they preached the same thing that Paul did. You see why I get a little uptight? Common sense, just common sense, tells me they couldn't preach Paul's gospel because all of Paul's gospel was resting on that death, burial, and resurrection. How can you preach something that hasn't happened? Well, you can't. And they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. Okay, back to Hebrews. Moses. Moses. That's what prompted that, wasn't it? Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, the minute, the minute the little fellow hit fresh air, what did they know? Hey, he's something special. He's not just another little Jew. He's not just another Israelite. 
This little fella is something special. All right? When he was born, because of their faith, they hid him three months because they, the parents, saw that he was a proper or a special child. Now, I don't think he was born with a halo around his head. I don't think he was born with some kind of an intrinsic baby doll face. But there was something about that little infant that those parents knew right away, this isn't an ordinary child. We can't throw him into the Nile River. And so they secretly built that little crib that would float on the river because they had to keep this child alive. All right, and so he was hid three months because they saw his brother, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now stop and think a minute. We are now 900 years after the call of Abraham. 430 years from Ur until no, not 900. It'd be around 400 and some years. I'm sorry. 430 years from Ur till they come out of Egypt under Moses. So it would be 300 and some years. But nevertheless, 300 and some years, and the children of Israel have never had a printed book. Think about that. What held them together? Faith, but oh, listen, how do you pass faith from one generation to the next? By word of mouth. And so the patriarchs were faithful in passing on their faith. That's what's happened to America. That's what's happened to the Western world. Christendom. Parents have been guilty of not passing on their faith. And I blame my generation the most of all. We were raised up in the Depression, and we said, my kids are not going to be deprived of everything like I was. And what have we done? We've ruined everything. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.